All right, it is 7:10, 7:12 on Monday, March 7th, and I would like to call the regular, the March regular meeting, the Narberth Planning Commission, uh, to order. Uh, I'd like to note that um, uh, commissioners uh, Boys, Crown, Spear, and Jeski Hyun are here in person, and Commissioner and Bressy are here in person, and Commissioners Brower. Uh, Jim Cornwell here? Not yet. Okay, Commissioner Brower is uh, online and Commissioner Cornwell has not yet joined us. Uh, we are joined today by Road Engineer Eric Johnson, uh, by one member of the public, and four people representing the applicants for 714, 715, or 14. 14. 14. Okay, Chinta is wrong. 714 Montgomery Avenue. Um, so, um, begin uh, with an update um, and a review of the agenda for tonight. Um, the update is that uh, the Planning Commission was front and center at the Borough Council meeting uh, last week. Um, we discussed uh, the uh, infill ordinance for about 45 minutes. I hope you all tuned in. It was scintillating. Um, and Council at the end recommended some changes to that ordinance before agreeing to advertise it. So they will formally vote to advertise it uh, this month, we hope. Um, so we can report more on that uh, in, uh, in, uh, later in the meeting. The ordinance for accessory dwelling units has been advertised, and so we will discuss that a little later tonight and make our formal recommendation to Council about that ordinance now that it has been, now that it has been advertised. Um, there's a uh, brief discussion of uh, a, a process for uh, collecting citizen input and generating a vision for town square slash station circle, uh, which and the council really invited us to lead that process. So Jim and Dave uh, will report on that uh, a little later this evening. Um, and I believe that is the highlight of the um, of the council meeting and what has happened since we last met. Um, Jim, last month or two, we designated you as a liaison to the Penn Valley Civic for Montgomery Avenue. Do you have anything to report in regard to you? Okay. All right. Um, so then uh, I'd like to move on to item B, which is a review of the January and February minutes, uh, which Adam uh, drafted uh, and amended January minutes based on the conversation we had. Uh, and so I'd like to know if anyone would like to make a motion uh, to adopt the minutes uh, for January. Let's start with January. Um, as revised based on our meeting last month. I move that we adopt the minutes. Is there a second? Second. Hi. Right. Is there any discussion about that? Hey, did the just accurately capture the uh, comments that you made? I think I'll leave it in. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other comments? All right, all in favor of approving the January minutes? Say aye. 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 Dave? There you go. All right. Any opposed? <laughs> okay, so uh, I will um, have those minutes posted to the uh, to the Planning Commission's website um, shortly. And then in terms of the February minutes, may I have a motion to approve the minutes of our February meeting? Okay. ID moves, and is there a second? We have no second to approve the minutes. I second. Adam second. <laughs> Out of self interest. Okay. Uh, any discussion about the minutes from the February meeting? Any comments, corrections, questions, concerns? Okay. All in favor of approving the minutes from our February meeting? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The minutes are. Uh, approved, uh, submitted by Adam. Adam, thank you very much for taking on this task. Um, it's a great help. Okay, so we will move to the next item of business. Uh, tonight we have one land development and subdivision application, the uh, tenant sketch plan review for 714 Montgomery Avenue. After that, we'll move on to our old business station circle, infill zoning amendment. I didn't put on here. So I, actually, I, I neglected to put the ABU Amendment on. Oh, I'd like to make a motion to amend our agenda to include a discussion and recommendation about the ADU ordinance. Can I have someone second that motion? Second. 
Okay, we can add this under new business. Any all in favor of adding that to our agenda? Okay. Uh, any all? Any opposed? Okay, so we will add that under new business. And then if we have time, we'll talk about the South, or at least get Chloe's guidance on how that's going to move forward. As usual, we will take public comment on each agenda item. So if there are folks in, in the the audience who would like to comment on the land development or any of the zoning uh, 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 amendments, we'll, we'll take comments as we're discussing them and then public comment at the end. All right, um, so I would like to welcome the team here uh, who's come here tonight to discuss uh, the, the tentative sketch plan for 714 Montgomery Avenue. Um, um, Michelle, uh, I think we're gonna have to ask you to coordinate with them and so I'll just ask uh, would you guys just like to give Michelle the signal about when to load it and when to advance it? Okay, Michelle, so they'll, they'll kind of tell you. Um, would you like us to load that up now, that presentation? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Michelle, can you load that presentation up? I hope she's there. Okay, there it is. Okay, thank you. Well, folks, I'll turn the floor over to you, Dan. Uh, we appreciate you coming tonight. We're looking forward to your presentation. Great. Um, so, first of all, thanks to everyone for having us here tonight. Um, we're here for 714 Montgomery Avenue, Price House, um, joined by uh, George Roseman from Captain Seward, Kathy Dockin from Baron Horse Architects, and uh, Rob Lambert from Site Engineering. Um, between us, we'll be able to answer all of your questions. Um, so, first of all, the property is uh, 714 Montgomery Avenue. Um, it's located next to uh, Bob's Service Station and uh, Car Crazy on Montgomery Avenue. And, and uh, it all gets a meeting house lane, uh, as you can see in the site, in the uh, aerial view. Um, a meeting house, again, it's, it's Bob's next to it, um, and it's across the street from the exit from the, uh, the right aid parking lot. Yeah, she, she, uh, Michelle, can you put the aerial off? Yeah. 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 There we go. So there we go. So that's the look. Um, I guess Michelle can go to the existing conditions plan. Or the street view. Oh, I'm sorry, the photo is the street view. Uh, so the top picture is the existing uh, front of the property. Um, that was the Price House. It was owned by Lincoln Hospital up until recently uh, when we purchased the property. Um, and it's been used uh, as the hamper shop uh, consignment store, um, I think, since around 1950 or so. Uh, as you can see in the back, the bottom are from Meeting House. And the uh, photo on the left on the bottom is uh, the old shed uh, that they used for furniture storage. Um, and that is to be demolished. Um, and then you can see uh, in the, uh, the right photo, that's the existing driveway off of uh, Meeting House Lane that's to be reused. And um, uh, you can see the back of the Price House. Um, the portion on the, um, that's good and to be demolished is just that the uh, garage and the one-story section on the uh, left side of the rear of the property in the photo. All right, we can uh, go to the uh, existing conditions plan. Michelle, it's sheet two of the, uh, there you go. Uh, so there you can see uh, existing conditions that shows the, the shed to be demolished on the left side. Uh, and uh, you can see the, the uh, original structure, which is the main rectangle of the uh, existing portion. And uh, uh, the odd shape is uh, the garage and the one story addition to be demolished. And we can go to the uh, proposed plan. Uh, so here's our proposed plan um, showing an addition to the existing building. Um, the existing building will be uh, retained as office use. And, um, the addition will contain uh, 10 residential condo units. Uh, those will be for sale. Should I interrupt for a second? Sure. I'm sorry. I, I neglected to mention I actually have hard copies of this. Oh, yeah, I'll take right. one. Okay. <laughs> That'd be easier. I'm so flustered by the internet stuff. Sure. So we'll take one over. Would you like to go back to? You can have it. 
technical details, as Mike indicated, this is a unique site. It has uh, this old building, as you saw in the photo, um, and maybe Michelle, if you wouldn't mind going back to the photo uh, for <clears throat> When you drive down Montgomery Avenue, um, this property, um, on its own lot at least, kind of has maintained its, its appearance. Of course, I don't know what it looked like. Uh, back in the 1800s or whenever it was built, but um, it's the front of the building in a nice uh, open space. Juxtaposed just to the left, you can see uh, you know, the overall setting uh, has been compromised off of the property. There's a gas station there. Um, so with this unique uh, condition, Mike uh, Friedman, the applicant, really took at the property and said, and the zoning ordinance, and you know, one of the top goals was to uh, preserve this uh, this building and its setting. Um, so, working with that and the uh, and the ordinance, you know, we came upon the idea to create a mixed-use building, which was consistent with the zoning, and thought it would be best to tuck that behind uh, this front facade. And by doing that, um, you know, this kind of uh, setting can be uh, maintained. Uh, we do acknowledge there are two uh, parking spots proposed. Uh, we got some comments about those, um, and Mike can tell you why they're important. But we thought that this was a really good uh, <clears throat> way to plan, and we thought that we were able to comply with the zoning ordinance. Uh, 
by tucking, by creating a mixed use building and by tucking it in the back and taking a surface parking lot in the back that you can see in the pictures here that uh, we don't think is very attractive and creating a nice streetscape along Meeting House uh, Lane as well. Uh, and uh, but for the two parking spaces I mentioned, uh, the plan that Mike was able to develop, you know, all of the parking is contained within the building, so it's screened from view, and there's a nice uh, street streetscape presence created along uh, Meeting House Lane. So looking at, um, I'll start with Kevin's letter first, um, and. Um, I won't go through every one unless you would like me to, but the two issues I see that are the biggest um, um, really relate to two issues. Uh, the first one comes up in item three. <clears throat> what is this building? And uh, does it meet the requirements for a mixed use building? And then comes four through eight, uh, or four through seven, really. Four through seven really deal with um, the treatment of the area in front of the uh, building. Uh, is it a front yard? What is the required front yard? Can the parking spaces be there? So um, all of those comments in four through seven really relate to that. So going back to comment three, <clears throat> what is this building? We're proposing it as an addition. Um, so we're proposing it as one principal building. Um, we believe it meets the uh, definition of a mixed-use building. The ordinance doesn't contain a lot of detail about what a mixed-use building is. It has language that it's a building intended for a vertical mixing of uses. And then there might be another definition that's very similar. Um, it doesn't address how that vertical mix of uses is to be established. And it doesn't prohibit horizontal uh, mixing of uses. Uh, that's all it really says. So. Um, the architecture for the building isn't that far along, but if uh, maybe you could go, please, Michelle, back to the site plan. <coughs> um, if you can picture then this as one building um, with one ground floor, so uh, in, the, uh, in the price house, that'll be ground floor commercial office use. And then as you proceed through the uh, connecting corridor, You'll go into the uh, other part, part of the first floor. There'll be a mix there of uh, parking, which is screened from view, um, <clears throat> a gymnasium space, uh, and a lobby space. Um, so uh, the first floor has that mix of uses. The um, second and third floor of the rear part of the building will have the residential uses. Uh, of course, the upper floors of the Price House will have uh, commercial. So we we believe that does meet uh, a vertical mixing of uses, um, and there's no other standards on that. So we, we believe it's one one principal building, one uh, mixed use building, uh, and we could find no other other um, requirements in the ordinance that we had to meet. Now Kevin's letter says that. Um, concern he raised was that the lobby and the parking and the gym you know should not count as a uh, <clears throat> as a different use but since this is all one building it's our position that it's the lobby the gym the parking and the commercial use of the price house so that is the first floor of the one principal building um, so and <clears throat> um, we have the mixing of uses there was a comment that you can't have residential use on the on the first floor. Uh, we don't have uh, residential use on the first floor. All of the condominium units will be on the second and third floor of the rear part of the building. Uh, of course, with any mixed use building uh, uh, where you have residential above, you would need some sort of lobby and ancillary facilities um, to reach those units from the ground floor. So we don't believe that's uh, prohibited. Uh, and we do think, as I said in the beginning, it's a good way to um, redevelop the property by preserving the price house, by putting this in the back, treating it as one uh, mixed use building. Um, if you look at table four of the zoning ordinance, it has 
um, all of the uh, area and bulk requirements, impervious coverage, building coverage. There's other provisions about height. This plan complies with all of, the, all, all of those uh, requirements. Uh, we have the required parking. Uh, we meet all of those. So the question that's come up uh, moving beyond the use is how do you treat the area? That, that picture I showed uh, that we were trying to preserve, how do you treat the area between the front of the Price House and Montgomery Avenue under the zoning ordinance? And uh, all of the comments in Kevin's letter, four to seven, I think relate to uh, the difference between, I'm gonna call it the actual setback, which as you can see is where the building is tight. Um, out to Montgomery Avenue and the required setback. Um, and I think um, those should be kept separate. Uh, when you look at some of the comments in the review letter and the requirements of the ordinance, um, for instance, uh, there's been a number of comments, can you have those two parking spaces in the front of the building? Uh, you cannot have them there if that's in the first uh, lot layer. Um, and then how do you figure out what the first lot layer is? Uh, when you go to table four uh, of the zoning ordinance, it says that the first uh, lot layer is uh, equivalent to the front yard setback. And, and there's a, a listing of what the uh, minimum and maximum front yard setbacks are. Three feet, six inches is the minimum. Nine feet, six inches is the maximum in the Montgomery, uh, Montgomery Avenue a 5B district. So, um, and then there's other provisions uh, dealing with parking in the uh, 5B district. And the ordinance uh, says that um, parking should be set back, and I'm looking for the exact provision. It's 601B. B5, specific to the 5B district, first says A, parking located in the second or third layer. B, off-street parking spaces and driveways, except for driveways that cross property lines, shall be set back no less than 12 feet from the primary frontage line and landscape. So uh, this is saying, uh, and there's another requirement, a couple other requirements about parking that we'll get to, but. As I read this, what this is saying is uh, your parking should be um, 12 feet back from the primary frontage line. There's a definition of primary frontage line in the definition section of the ordinance, and it's important. It says primary. A line parallel tangent to the street that the front facade faces. So the front facade of the Price House is facing Montgomery Avenue. So it's a line parallel to the street that the front facade faces. It doesn't say it's measured from the front facade. It says it's telling you what line to look at. And then it says um, located at a distance equal to the required front setback, or required front setback. So that, that's where I was saying there's a difference between the actual existing setback and required setback. So this rule is saying the primary frontage line is at a distance equal to the required front setback. The required front setback is at table four for the 5B district. It's the three feet, six inches, and the nine feet, six inch max that I, I referred to. Uh, going back to the position 601, Five, that would be, uh, and section C uh, isn't really an issue. Uh, D isn't really an issue, just saying your driveway can cross over. Then E, parking spaces that grade underneath the building shall be set back at least 40 feet from the primary frontage line and screen from view of adjacent streets. Uh, the spaces uh, in, in, in letter, um, in addition to raising a question about the two spaces in the front, um, would it be okay if I point to you? Sorry, Pat. Um, in addition to the spaces in the front, he was saying that 
as I read it, he's applying the, the required setbacks to be ex the same as the existing setback. And then if you take that and you measure 40 feet back, you can't have parking. Uh, so not only is he saying these parking uh, spaces are a problem, but the spaces we talked in the back behind the Price House are a problem. But I read this provision to say that uh, the parking spaces at grade underneath a building shall be set back at least 40 feet from the primary frontage line. Then we go back to that provision that I just read. The primary frontage line, again, is the line uh, and it's measured at the required setback, not at the actual or existing setback. So we believe that um, the uh, primary frontage line is as we've shown it on this plan. We have the 12 feet drawn. Um, it's measured off the right away, and it shows that the, uh, the parking is out of it. And the first parking spot, it's under the building and screen from view, but it's over 70 feet away from there. Interpreting the ordinance in this way, we believe is fair and makes sense and allows uh, this project to happen. Otherwise, uh, you'd be saying you're penalized for not adding on to the front of the price house because if you don't, if you don't add on and build out in the front to build up to your stack, which could have been three feet, six inches, um, you're going to be penalized, and we're going to count the primary frontage line as measuring not from where you but that big, nice setback you had is going to cause uh, problems for you. That, that doesn't seem to be uh, logical in this case. So we were hoping that we could work with Kevin, Eric, and the borough to see if we can uh, work that issue out and uh, you know, agree with that plan. Uh, with, the, uh, with the rest of Kevin's comments, he did say, number one, that a uh, certificate of appropriateness should be required. We wanted to speak to the borough about that. Um, if that is really required, we, we feel that the, the building is not being demolished, and we think we can show that the part that is being demolished is not really the, the significant part of the building. But if that was required, uh, you know, we would, uh, we would do what is required. Um, Number two, I think, was a technical matter that we comply with. Number eight, it's just information to be provided at preliminary plan and final plan. We'd be happy to do that. Um, Eric Slur, um, I think we're all uh, will comply except the issues. He raised some similar issues that Kevin did. So if we resolve issues, uh, Satisfactorily, I think we would address the issues that he raised on those points. Um, Rob could explain uh, the gap in boundaries comment in number eight and uh, our review letter. I, uh, I guess the uh, candidate, you know, they didn't like the two spots in the front. Uh, Mike can tell you why they're important, and the county offered some solutions. Uh, they suggested that. Those spots be re relocated, and uh, also suggested that the parking requirement might be able to be reduced by using shared parking. Uh, I think, you know, we think those spots are good, and we think they can be uh, landscaped in a way that will not detract from the price house. But I think Mike is willing to look at that. If that was the only issue, like, could they be uh, relocated? I don't know, Mike, if you yeah. want to comment on why they want um, them. Yeah, I think uh, the reason why we feel that the spots do make sense up there are uh, a couple things. One, um, the uh, office professional use in the uh, front portion of the building, um, it's you know, it to a professional sign in Montgomery. When are in use. Um, uh, and in addition, because they'll be used mostly for, for that use in there, uh, and in addition to that, we, we would follow the landscape uh, requirement. Uh, that, that's our logic, uh, why we want, want the spots there. there. 
again, we think it complies because we think it's in, in, the, uh, in the second lot layer. That's all right. So I apologize. Like I said in the chat, um, we're up over in Jersey and the storms are pretty windy. So between all of that, the Wi-Fi issues, um, my audio is pretty choppy here. Um, so bear with me and just let me know if you can't hear everything I'm saying. Um, as was stated prior, most of my comments, specifically for um, are in regards to where the setback is taken on the property. Um, just to go back to the original iteration of the plan, I think that those setbacks that were provided in the original uh, January submission are accurate um, and in agreement with what the borough requires. Um, and what that requires is the front setback for existing building to be placed at the facade, uh, primarily due to mission. So we have frontage line, which I believe was already stated, but that's a line parallel or tangent to a street located at a distance east to the required setback. And then the, the uh, front setback is the area of lot measured from a lot line, I'm sorry, from a lot line to a facade or elevation that is clear of permanent structure, not to include portions of the structure authorized as encroachments. For the front setback, cannot be an existing and a required. There can't be two for one lot. It's an existing building. There's simply the existing setback, which for this property would be the front facade of the Price property facing Montgomery Avenue. So in other words, the original iteration which showed the front setback was from the curb line to the, I believe that was accurate. Uh, I believe the measurement was 43 feet. Uh, and therefore that, a lot of the other requirements and comments that I had, uh, whether or not that's a um, disagreement in my interpretation, I feel strongly that my interpretation is right. Uh, moreover, I believe that the table four required setbacks are for planning new developments. So this would be a blank slate and a completely vacant lot. Yes, I would agree that if that was the case, you get to choose your setback anywhere from three feet, six inches to nine feet, six inches. However, we do have building and therefore the front setback should be taken too. Um, that's kind of the basis for comments three through seven. Um, triggers, the parking comments, uh, both in the first slot layer and in the garage. Um, so I'm happy to work through those, but I, I, I feel strongly that the interpretation is pretty clear in the code uh, through not only the tables, but the definitions. I, I think three, I think the mixed use building, um, as you stated, I have two sections, and that's all we have to go off of, stating that they do have to be, or intended to be, um, vertically. Um, and just looking at the property, I don't see that vertical mixture of uh, the example where you broke down by looking kind of as the whole first floor, as if you slice the building into three pieces. Um, I just don't see that. I think that if there was no gallery or corridor, and I understand it is there, gallery slash corridor that really has no use it's really a kind of a vacant use it's not commercial it's not residential we would call that back building an apartment building uh, there's no other use other than residential uh, there's no commercial space there's no retail space there's no light industry space i feel like all that back building just an apartment building other than that connection uh, so i tried to explain that as best i could uh, only that we have to have vertical mixes of use. I don't necessarily agree with um, what you presented, but I don't see any other way to not 
require vertical mixing purposes. Okay. Hey, Kevin, sometimes your audio, your, your audio really is choppy, so and I know sometimes if you stop sharing your video, the audio improves. So maybe you could ask if you could try that, turn off your camera. Sure, is that helping at all? Maybe. <laughs> Let's see. Um, what I'd like to do today, I, I, was, I think it's important to hear responses to the zoning officer's letter and to hear the zoning officer explain his interpretation, particularly for members of the public who don't have the benefit of reading the letters. But I don't think this is the right forum tonight to kind of debate the interpretations of the code. So I hope we can avoid that and talk. I think what we ought to talk about more is um, the appropriateness from our understanding of what we are trying to achieve in Narver through our code of, of, of some of these issues, the parking in front of the building, without actually getting the specifics of the language in the code. Um, but I do want to ask a question to clarify something, which follows up on what Kevin said, which is um, whether or not, whatever your interpretation of vertical or horizontal uses, the code is, is pretty clear that residential is not allowed on the ground floor of a mixed use building through the district. So, affirmatively tell me what the use is that portion of the building is in our zoning code you are proposing for the first floor. I'll have to open up the code. And Okay. I will in a minute. If you'd like. Uh, but I would say, uh, are you just isolating that part of the first floor? Your yes. ice house? We don't have potential on the floor of the mixed building in the 5D district. So the price house does. You're not proposing any kind of residential. You I want to clarify, it's one building. So the first correct. floor includes from the front facade of the existing price house to the rear facade of the proposed addition. That's, that is the floor. I, don't want, I, I just want to, I don't want to separate the two. So we can't separate the two. So the use on the first floor is a mix of office, parking, and accessory uses, which will be okay. accessory to both residential and office. So, we do not allow, whether it's one building or two, we would not allow residential on the ground floor. That's not residential. But if it's accessory to residential, it's residential. What is affirmatively the land use? How would you, proposing? how would you, a mixed use building that are your house There's a question. Can you tell me what the land use is on the ground floor of the rear portion? It's not a theory, it's a question. Well, first of all, we don't, uh, we, um, for argument's sake, separate them. We have a mix of commercial and residential parking. That parking that's in that building is for the, uh, for the uh, commercial use of the building, and that is on the ground floor. Um, there's a gymnasium and there's a lobby. Uh, those are permitted accessory uses. Accessory uh, and the parking is accessory. The parking is accessory to the to the building, provides the commercial and the residential, and um, and it's to be determined what the gym is that could be available for the use of the tenants in the uh, in the uh, on, on the remainder of the first floor, the commercial tenants. So um, and residential is not defined in the ordinance. Residential, we, we say, is really the residential condominium units. And if, if this was one mix, uh, used building, say, on a different property, that how we've decided, um, and there was a, a, uh, a pop on the ground floor and a gymnasium, and then a rental above, there would be some lobby, some um, as well as building, you have to have the ancillary city on the ground floor to get to the upper resident in any building. It would be impossible to meet the building code or to get to it. So, question is in trash special use. 
residential accessory uses are prohibited or served in state of the just ask you some since we're not here to debate the codes and it's not as well. I've chosen for that ground floor, I thought. And what you're no, you're you're ignoring the remainder of the ground floor. I'm just talking That's about that not fair. Simple question. The answer is it's an accessory use to commercial, it's an accessory use to residential. It's not what I heard. What did you hear? It's, it's office and office accessory. No, I just asked for the back portion of the building. What is the ground floor use? Not the front portion. It's clear with the front portion. Thank you. The simple question is what is the land use on the back portion of the building? Well, that's the question. So I think the answer is, well, there are certain uses in the front portion of the building, the back portion of the building is accessory uses. Okay. So that will be for the zoning officer to to uh, get to uh, to consider. So the real question I'd like to ask the planning commission, in addition to any questions you have, is despite whatever the interpretations are, the code is uh, the proposal is being made. Um, your, what is your feeling about the uh, appropriateness of the proposal and the context of what we are trying to achieve in that sort of this Do you have any other particular questions? I'll just go around. So, uh, Heidi, would you like to? I kind of like to hear what other people are saying first. Because I know that some people here have more units. And do we have the puff? Just in general, the approach of this development of different features we've been talking about in terms of what we're trying to achieve. That's our understanding. I think it could use a little more work <laughs> on the concept. I, I don't see how the parking in front is ever going to be appropriate. But is there anything more you'd like to say about what you think needs more work? I, I, I'm with Heidi. I kind of like to hear what. Other people say, Jim, <laughs> Jim, you're up. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's pretty clear that, well, in terms of the setback, I think it's pretty clear that the the first lot layer ends at the existing building. Uh, uh, any other interpretation doesn't you know, make sense to me. Uh, in terms of the use. I understand that this is um, meant to be one building. It's an interesting interpretation of use. I don't think we've had a horizontal mix of use ever come in front of us before. I'm not sure how that's going to apply. However, not, it's not inappropriate to make that back building entirely residential and accessory to residential. Would that kind of make something we have? The building that's replacing Rickland's does have parking that's accessory to the residential use within the footprint of the building. You know, if you could consider it similar to that. Um, I don't think it's all that wild a theory, frankly. Yeah, yeah. I want to try to steer away from okay. our feelings about what the code sets. I would sort of just like try your reactions. So for example, there is a discussion about the parking in front as being very important to the function of this property and development. Is that an issue that you think? Is, it, is that it's just in general an appropriate thing for us to have? Parking in the front. Yeah. 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 So, to me, that's indisputed, undisputable that that's the first law layer. So, and we don't allow that at all. We, that's not even available to the zone airport. So I don't see how that's going to work. But the use of the back, I don't, I don't see why. It's, I'm not sure why it would be 
for the damage to insist that there be commercial activity out of the house, so close to the rest of the residential. So, I'm so prepared to accept that interpretation more, more than I am. Yeah, I want to get away from interpretation. Okay. It's like, right. it's because that's going to be, that's adjudicated elsewhere. I'm just, I think it's a, to state what we think. We're trying to accomplish. Well, okay. Whether or not this is consistent. I mean, it's definitely it's a commercial commercial lot, but it does closely border a residential area. Um, and I think we are just ought to consider that the back portion is, is by nature probably going to be more residential than commercial. That's probably the way we want. Jennifer, do you have any reactions? I mean, just the first thing that came to mind when I saw the plan, and again, it's really, I find it difficult to fully um, understand the architecture without seeing an elevation or a section or some proposed even landscape. But this um, corridor connecting piece is interesting. And I guess my problem is there's a lot of hardscape. And you have this historic element and you have this gallery corridor, and then you have a lot of parking and a lot of car escape and driving, and, and it feels sort of um, compact. I think I would like to see something with a little bit more green incorporated into its overall configuration on the lot, so that this gallery corridor has a more um, a sense of actually being in a site that does have a historic piece to it. Um, I think that would give it scale. It would encourage more pedestrian flow. It would seem less like um, less like a big mess. You know, I think we we are really we want to encourage um, green space and. Architecture is a great way to get into green space and vice versa. Um, so maybe more, um, you know, thinking more about how to configure green space within this. Uh, Dave, um, you're on the line, Dave Brower. I don't see Jim, but I see you, Dave. If you are tuned in, would you like this? I'm just sort of asking your reactions to the well, my my biggest problem, and I don't know if you can hear me because on my end, the the audio quality is is atrocious, and I'm getting about ten percent of the discussion. So I, you know, from what I can gather, and I haven't had time to study this independently since we only saw this this afternoon. Uh, I, at least at this first take on it, I agree with Kevin's uh, interpretation about the, the parking in the front yard. And I, I think uh, besides all of the definitions that he talked about, or as much as I could surmise, um, uh, putting parking in the front yard would also be completely contrary to the historic district ordinance intents, uh, if not the exact language, which I've not had a chance to look at. Uh, in terms of, of the rest of the submission, like I said, I had a very hard time following the discussion um, about the mixed use, uh, and I haven't had time to study it. Uh, what I would say is just looking at a submission on the basis of the site plan for, for uh, a project like this uh, really is insufficient. Uh, this, what I, what I surmise to be a three-story building, will completely dominate the, the uh, Price Building from Montgomery Avenue. Uh, I don't know if what the, what the height is, uh, but it, it, I would imagine that the height of the new building will be uh, just about uh, as high as the existing building, uh, if not the same height. So I think uh, this submission has to be seen also in three dimensions uh, as well as two dimensions. Uh, so I think that's about all that I'm prepared to talk about at this point given my understanding of it, but uh, there's obviously a lot more to look at. Yeah, I, I'd like to just ask a question. Um, so the, the structures, the one-story structures at the back of the building, 
you know when, when they date from? I do have some info on it, but I don't have it. I can get that to you. I don't have it. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I can, I can tell you that there was an addition on the rear of the building in the area where the additions um, are now. I think it had a, I think it had a shed roof uh, from the, there's some postcards that date to really nice early 20th century. Uh, I think that that addition has either been enveloped by the other, there are three pieces of that addition. <laughs> My suspicion is that the, the original addition is probably somewhere in there. Uh, so I'll, I can save my comments for later, but uh, no, please. Uh, I, I do believe that part of that addition um, is, is likely to be late 19th, um, early 20th century, if, if not even earlier. So, I mean, would it in fact then be considered that it would be up for review whether you can demolish those under our historic ordinance? As it just they cover the back of the structure. It's visible from a public right away. That's all I yeah. I just put up the an aerial view of the site. Oh, when is that from? This is from Mara two days ago. Oh, no. Okay. A year and two days ago. Well, okay. Yeah. Okay. One year ago. It's from one year ago. Uh, so it's showing, I guess this is what Kathleen was saying, that there's maybe an older edition that's part of this and then additional additions that were added. So there's a garage to the left and then the two parts that made up in the earlier part. They appear to be, well, I don't know, just to make the record, but they appear to be one structure. There's, it's open inside, there's no interior wall in there. It, from, from early postcards and images that I've seen, it appears that the far right component of that is in is in the same spot as as, as this earlier edition yep. um, because it is uh, uh, the wall of, of of the main building um, extends uh, extend into that addition area. But I, I can't be certain. So um, so my second part of that question is. Um, until you said you were making this one building, I was wondering why there was that gallery gallery link. I thought that was a very odd thing to have. It, architecturally, it's very strange. Um, if it's purely because in order to build the residential portion and to have it be mixed use, that needs to be considered one building and therefore that link makes it to me that's like a real hole <laughs> in in maybe your analysis or our writing of the code um and i'm you know i'm sitting here thinking well why didn't you just subdivide the property and keep the price of house whole and build your apartment house in the back in the ugly parking lot which it is and and make a building which makes more sense basically i mean it, that's Jennifer pointed out, I mean, we have no idea what it looks like. It's a blob, basically. Um, and that, so, so I'm having a hard time reading the drawing as anything that I can kind of feel happy about, just because right now it's not designed as like a pleasing structure. I mean, it is jammed up against you know, Meaty Cast Lane. Um, the, the mixed use portion of it, which you kind of feel like should address the street somehow, is actually just the back side. It's not a street frontage. I, I see an attempt to carve out the front so that it has the indents which are required by the code so it's not just a massive wall, but that's going to be a three-story high wall there. I, I, don't, I don't feel cozy comfortable with the way it's presented right now. I feel like it needs to be thought about as a real building. And maybe, I, I don't know what our opportunity is because this is just a schematic plan without any detail, but what opportunities are there to 
consider this two primary buildings on the site. Is there any kind of special exception? Well, I, wanted, I wanted to ask that actually. Um, Adam, do you mind if I jump in? Because I'm calling you next. So we do offer two other op options for a site like this. One is the subdivided, two, two lots. And, and the other is we have in this portion of the Browns, Heidi was suggesting a provision where you can create two primary buildings on a lot, not without having to subdivide. And so I'm wondering if you evaluated either which would allow, which would potentially avoid the need for that connector in the long way. So I'm wondering if you evaluated either of those. Uh, and th that's why we put that in the code provide a little more flexibility in these kind of crazy situations. So I'm wondering if you evaluated either of those paths, either the subdivision or the multiple uh, primary buildings on the lot. Uh, we had thought about it briefly. Um, even if we did go that route, uh, we would still want to demolish the garage and one story uh, addition on the back of the existing building, even if we did go that route. All that would really eliminate would be that connector um, that does require conditional use under the code. Um, so we, we, it, we're going to end up in a similar place. Why, why do you want to demolish this? Um, we, need, we need the space. A space for driveway? We need it for building driveway for how we want to. You know, how we, we envision the project. I mean, they don't take as much room. Do you have more that you've already done that we're no. not seeing? No, we don't. Oh. With multiple buildings would uh, be a path to uh, essentially creating the same slave plan without the connector. So, they have to have a commercial on the ground floor. I didn't say anything. I just asked them about so if you had two buildings on the site, I'm just curious. Does the second building have to have a commercial ground floor? It has to have something other than residential. They would use the same arguments they're using now. That's why. I, I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't agree with that. Because I think, I think the argument they're making is, you know, that this umbilical cord connection makes it one structure, blah, blah, blah. So you may have two structures, uh, and you can... You know, drop that, uh, then the second structure uh, could not be residential on the ground floor, I guess, Under, because it's still be, you know, be on, to be this open. So, could not be residential, I guess, is the one way to phrase it, as opposed to does it have to be something that's, does it have to have a use other than parking? Um, I'm not. I, I I would say my personal interpretation is, but my personal interpretation is really count. <laughs> um, I I don't believe um, that our code means that you can have uh, an accessory use of parking or you know, aside from perhaps a lobby. But but uh, I, I don't. In fact, well, anyway, I don't I don't think the code allows that. I think they have to have a use, which is uh, listed in our list of uses. So if, we had a second, if we had a second, pick them and mix them. Yeah, yeah. If you had a second building, that building itself would have to be mixed use. It have, you know, and by mixed use, we mean it has to have a use other than residential in the structure on the ground. Well, wait. That's what I think. That's what there are. So well, wait. They would use the same argument. Oh, for two principal buildings. Because it would still be five, and it can't be just an apartment building? No. No. Apartment building. I'm happy to offer my opinion on that if you guys are interested. Yes, I am. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if they were separated, yeah, like currently is situated what I mentioned in my letter, um, and I know they're they're not separated, um, but I would recognize that back building as an apartment building. They're simply residential use. Parking is not a use in our code anyway, and therefore it would require something other than parking slash accessory residential uses to be considered um, mixed use. And of, uh, of course, I think the applicant's aware it's an apartment building is not permitted by right as a use. So it would have to be mixed use. And therefore, they'd have to plug um, either retail or light industry or, or just some other use designated to that first floor. Well, I didn't bring this up to debate the current I brought it up because the question is, are, are there ways to develop the site without creating that? Yeah, I, don't, I don't think we're debating it at all. I think 
what I heard clearly was the zoning officer's interpretation is that it's an apartment, right? But, you know, so it's not a debate, right? That's just a finding as well. I think I think the applicants are saying something different. Well, they're, yeah, they're saying as considered as one building, they want to consider the ground floor of the price house as the quote ground floor, and it has a non-residential use of the structure. So that's the argument. I don't, I don't want to get it. Accessory to the retail, so that counts as being non residential. Parking is accessory to the to the to the commercial and retail, or whatever goes in the price line. So that makes it in that there from their point of view, an accessory use can be considered non residential. That was what he said. Okay. That's, that's what you said, correct? That was your well, argument. Well, we were. Oh, you're not arguing that. But, yeah, maybe an argument for a different plan, but we were talking about this plan. I was with this gentleman, uh, Adam. Is it? <laughs> we were arguing that it's one building and you look at the ground floor of that building and all of the uses together. We haven't gotten to a, a place if we separated it. What? So I, do have, I do have design comments, I guess. I, mean, I, would, I, I think just, I mean, start out, it's a challenge to work with this property, right? It's an odd shape. You have a historic resource. Uh, and there's probably many other challenges we could enumerate, right? So it's definitely, uh, um, it, in terms of trying to do what you're trying to do, I guess I should say, right? To, to, to add a lot more program. Um, my personal opinion is that the parking and vehicular circulation is a big part of the problem because it's driving so much of the layout of the site. Um, you know, the, 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 the front yard parking is probably off the table because it doesn't conform, I, I don't think. But even even so, it's not the right thing to do for the site. And its utility for the site is very, very low. Like two, two parking spaces with tight geometry don't really add the amenity that's being described. I don't think as much as a clear direction of where to park. The driveway might be added something more value, but again, very constrained. The parking for the, the residential program itself is, I don't know that you can actually get this many um, spaces once you try to do all the geometry of backing out, I mean, maybe, but you know, you're really, really pushing it. And the dollar thing that you're using the land for on a, you know, is this parking and circulation. And when you go to market the units, they're all 10 feet off of the side of the property, but you know, look, balconies looking over a sort of, uh, they don't have a yard to look at, they don't have really anything to look at much. So the, uh, you're, you're taking what is a large site and you're creating nothing for the apartments to, to interact with, if that makes sense. Um, with the exceptions of the ones that might face on to the council lane. Um, all, the, all the other facades don't really face on that much. I think the argument that the gallery, so we heard that, you know, there, there could be some discussion back and forth about whether demolishing the addition is appropriate for the historic resource. But even setting that aside, you know, there, it is a question whether this would constitute an addition onto the house or whether it's sort of the gallery's kind of fig leaf to try to make it seem like it's an addition onto the structure. Um, I think you could argue that it serves as a walkway from the parking garage to the commercial and so on, but it's pretty pretty tenuous connection because if you deleted it, the, the, the thing works exactly the same way, right? So uh, I do wonder if you could get a similar amount of program uh, through reorganizing it. I think it probably, if it was two buildings, it might make it easier. It might not, but it might make it easier to make it read as a, but you might have to give something up. And then and I'm sure you'll hear impressions about well you heard people want to preserve the house the the maximize its view from Montgomery as a historic resource so to make sure that the structure doesn't say bloom over it from the rear and that it's compatible with the surrounding lands. As you, as you if you went further with architecture you know it, it might clarify some of these issues but I do think it's it's gonna be a these, these 88 parking spaces and the parking space space in the driveway, for example, I mean, the whole experience of the ground floor is just going to be nothing but cars. Is that guy with the and white shirt? Oh, excuse me. Please. Please. Oh, it's not needed. 
<laughs> so that's my comment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I'll just add one, one comment. Um, I, I particularly think that if there, if you had to like list the bedrock principles of what we're trying to accomplish, it's not parking in front of them. It's just simply a non-start. Uh, of course, parking makes sense. People would love to pull off the street and park in their parking spaces, but um, we, we really have, have, have uh, tried everything we can to prevent parking in front of parking, in front of buildings. Uh, from happening, so that it is so out of touch with the spirit of what we're trying to achieve, no matter what you think your arguments are, that I think that it's, it's going to be a very, very hard sell here at Dartmouth to do that. I, I also think we've seen a lot of proposals, as I uh, pointed out, and I think Jen sort of pointing out too, which um, go overboard in the automobile infrastructure and the, and the, and the infrastructure, driveways and so forth. And, I think we, we constantly see among our commissioners, among our community, uh, a desire for strategies that really minimize minimize the amount of land that's devoted to cars. Um, we are we are building a walking community here, not a driving community. And I think that it's important for us uh, in all cases to try and figure out what is the way we can minimize the amount of space. I think Adam's points are interesting about how. Parking then begins to drive the site uh, in addition to the house. And so I, I think that's all. That's really, that's really, and, and how that, that kind of drives the quality of the experience of the project. I think that's all, that's all uh, worth considering. Um, despite what I've been saying about that ground floor, um, given the way our code works, I, I think that at the very, you know, having a little gym. As opposed to parking spaces, facing the street is obviously better. You know, uh, no matter what the code interpretations are, having some kind of activities on the street recognizes what we're trying to create, which is interesting pedestrian streets, not places where people are walking by parking lots. So, wherever the code lands, I, I think that's 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 not a terribly bad outcome to have a gym on the front. I appreciate your you're thinking about what the street. The streetscape experience would be like. I, I'm not sure about the code interpretation, but I, I don't think that's a, at least on the face of a bad outcome. Um, so, the, and, and I am, I really truly really wish if that um, connector really didn't have a essential function, it was sort of only there to kind of help you know, fulfill certain kinds of code requirements that we could find a way uh, to, to do that. One of the things I wanted to ask is if, if that. If you can accomplish this and, and receive a, approval for it, more or less, but then seek a variance to eliminate that connection, uh, that wouldn't be a variance that is which 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 on which your overall development is contingent on, just something to achieve a, a better outcome. Uh, would that be a route to consider a way to eliminate that? Which means if you didn't get the variance, you could still go ahead, right? It's just that if you got the variance, then you could eliminate that. Yeah, a slightly nicer project. Is that something you consider? I think we could consider. Um, I'm going to ask now um, if there are any other planning commissioner or Chloe. I'm sorry. Yeah, I just want to make a brief comment. I'm Chloe Moore, the county planner, uh, which is that did that didn't come up yet in this meeting, which is related to the connector hallway. Um, that we've seen that there are these. These uh, uh, additions here, the applicant is proposing to demolish them. There's clearly some kind of a doorway here at the, the very sort of west edge of the rear of the Price House already. But the connector hallway that's proposed goes from the new proposed building all the way across the rear of the Price House, I think, to approximately this location. And if instead the connector hallway could be seen, significantly shorter and just lead to this doorway, it would leave most of the rear of the price house unobstructed. So that's, I think that, you know, as it, just from a design perspective, having the connector hallway be shorter and just connecting to whatever doorway is already here, that's, uh, that, that would, that would result in a better project. And uh, just to weigh in from the county perspective, this is 
this area is the, the, town, the town center land use in our comprehensive plan, and we do not want to see parking in front of buildings. So from even from the county comprehensive plan perspective, we also would request that we try to find a way to do the parking without putting the spaces in front of, especially a historic structure. That's it. Um, I will uh, open it up to public comment and then uh, come back to commissioners. Um, so I'll start with the uh, public who are in the room, uh, which is one person. Could you introduce yourself and then uh, you're interested in sharing your thoughts tonight? Sure, thanks. Uh, I'm Kathleen Alphonel. I represent the Lower Marion Conservancy. Um, for those uh, who are watching online, Conservancy is a nonprofit organization that serves. Uh, Laura Marion and Garber. Um, so I first have a question for the commission, and, and this, can you clarify uh, whether this project will be going to CARB? Because looking at uh, the plan and, and the proposals, it, it appears that uh, several proposals uh, would require a certificate of appropriateness, um, the removal of the rear additions, and also the one story corridor connecting the old building to the new building would be covering um, window openings and, and the preservation ordinance. Um, I'm doing that to a contributing resource would require a certificate of appropriateness. And so I, I think from um, Mr. Brosen's testimony, he wasn't sure either whether this would be going. Before the park. So, if, if uh, we could get an answer to that tonight, that would be great. Um, certainly, it would be you know, our recommendation or our preference. We believe that um, the proposal uh, does, re does require that. Um, the, the second question that I have is in, in the applicant plan, um, I see a square box representing the, the price house, but I don't see the porch edition on that. That is part of the, part the of box that you see there. Okay. That porch edition is part because it spans from front to back the entire existing structure. Right. So okay. you won't That's see right. that as a separate. You don't see it as a projection. Correct. Right. Okay. Um, uh, third comment that I, I, I would like to make uh, uh, is with regard to the, the parking in the front. So regardless of whether it needs to go in I'm happy to hear that the commissioner of the thinks think that it doesn't. Um, it's it's entirely inappropriate uh, place to put um, parking. I just want to draw your attention back to this building that we're looking at. It's the 1803 Price House. It's the most significant building in our um, the, the owner of the building uh, owned you know, hundreds of acres. Uh, Narva was essentially created because of him. Um, the building has been subsumed by development and it has lost a lot of its context. But uh, fortunately, um, and I'm, I'm very happy to know that there's somebody out there who's interested in revitalizing it and rehabbing this building and giving it a new use because the, the previous uh, owner, uh, like an hospital, um, was a uh, neglected the building um, for a long period of time, but in the course of neglecting the building, in some ways saved it. So the building has remarkable um, architectural integrity inside and outside. And it's just um, one of a handful of buildings in this area that really retains its, uh, its historic fabric. Um, but also the context in the front, you really get to see, you get to see the building. And I know that with uh, a rehab, um, Attention will be paid to uh, you know, making repairs and painting and you know really sprucing it up to make it look nice from Montgomery Avenue. So putting parking in front of that um, really sort of it really diminishes it. It also diminishes the, you know, the pedestrian experience. So again, you know whatever the code says, anywhere that you put parking, um, let's try to avoid having it in the front. Uh, Let's see. Uh, oh, and then and the last thing, it's, and it's difficult again, I, I think, without seeing elevations like Jen and, and Heidi had mentioned, it's really hard to 
read this building or to understand it um, from the street or from the rear. But if it's going to be three stories high, it, it really subsumes the, the price building, uh, which is, you know, it's a, it's a gem in our earth. So I hope that you can you know, pay attention to those kinds of you know, larger details when you're refining your plan uh, to find a way uh, to maintain the, the presence of the price house on on Avenue. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, I would like to invite members of the public who are uh, online to um, let me know if you are interested in commenting on or asking any questions about this project. If you are, please uh, indicate that in the chat or use the uh, raise your hand function. I see three or four people from the public, five, six people from the public on the meeting. Is there anyone there who would like to make a comment or ask a question? I don't see anyone indicating that, so we will close the public comment on this topic. Okay. So um, the first question I'll ask is, are there any um, planning commissioners tonight? We don't have to uh, make a recommendation to the council has until it's the April business meeting to um, uh, formally final to, to make a, a vote on this application. So we are not, it's not necessary for us if we don't feel ready to make a recommendation. So uh, what I'd like to do is get the sense of the planning commissioners of uh, if you feel as if we are heading towards some sort of set of ideas we'd like to convey to the council or wrap up into a recommendation, uh, or you simply to uh, provide some feedback on the application at this point and ask for uh, the applicant to come back and give me. Does anyone feel like uh, we're at the point where you are Interested in making a recommendation to council? No, anyone? Well, it's not going to, to council for this. No, but we could make a recommendation. We would not recommend approving the permit right on this day in front of the building. Like, that, that's not acceptable. So, right. I would I would vote to recommend that. So, right? Or am I? No, no, I'm just asking it, it, do you, would you rather just kind of tonight? I guess we have a choice. We can either, uh, as is our duty, make a recommendation to council on what action should be taken on this application, or we can sort of just summarize what our impressions are of it and what the strengths and weaknesses are, issue that letter, and then ask the applicant to come back next month. I think so that's the first question. Does anyone feel strong about making a recommendation tonight? Or just, okay. Okay. So, my next question is that uh, what I'd like to surface to keep that we feel like we should have some way feedback on this project that we can agree on uh, by consensus. I'd like to go back to the idea of there being two buildings. Um, and I would just like to ask what the possibility is of making it two properties because the the apartment building cost, I mean, in the and this is actually a question. I don't know who this is a question for. Maybe Kevin. If it was subdivided, could that second property be considered part of the residential district? Would it be rezoned at the same time? And therefore, it could be an apartment building and be completely, completely differently and fit more into the residential neighborhood. And be separate from the price house, which is a gem or our borough, and really would benefit from being treated as a separate property and would be a lovely commercial building on its own. I, I, would, I, I just would kind of pose that as a question back to the commission. Yeah. Um, you know, if we did the two building route, uh, that would require a conditional use. Um, would the commission be amenable to? A use of an apartment building on the rear if we went from a rear building in that scenario. Well, and, well and, and I guess it's a question for you too is 
what, or for anybody here could weigh in, what's the difference between two principal buildings on a lot versus two separate properties? I, I think that Adam uh, touched on that actually, which would be able to require the mixed use in the rear building. Well, no, if it's if it's a different zoning district. I don't think that's going to work out because even if that were zoned to a different zone, it would be 3B. You did not allow her to be in my condition. Is that right? I mean, I don't know. Would it be yeah. automatically 3B? Well, well, that's the adjacent. Yeah. The home that is that home is adjacent is 3B. So. Unless we've just zoned it briefly C somehow. But it would have to be another kind of change to offer the Yeah. But I think his question stands is, is that would be a, a condition more of a conditional. It, could we make that a condition in that case? I could, I, I, I might be able to work on that. Yeah, I mean, because certainly the way it fronts which the would allow the residential use on the first floor, and we can look into maybe some other options regarding that if that would be amenable. I mean, I personally, I, I think that's a nicer use of the site, but. Um, before we, I think that's really worth talking about. Um, however, Heidi, I'd like you kind of propose a solution, but I'm kind of wondering what's the concern trying to address. I'm not, I'm not certain with how it fits into this residential neighborhood. Like the transition to residential. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, we could run with this sort of conversation, but I'm, I'm curious how do other planning commissioners react to that if it were possible to create two buildings here and have one of them, the rear one, be an apartment building. I don't want to get the gymnastics of the zoning. But I'm trying to find our, our thoughts about a solution that's good for the community. Uh, do you think that that would be uh, an outcome that would be worth driving towards if it could be thinking about? That's what you're proposing. Right. And Dave, um, are you still with us? Feel free to jump in. Yes, I am here. <laughs> um, Struggling to uh, follow uh, the conversation. Uh, <laughs> uh, I know you're not feeling well, Dave, too. So thanks for hanging in there. Um, is that, how do other folks react to that idea? Yeah. I, I think it's worth it's, you know, exploring. Um, and, you know, it would maintain the integrity of the historic piece. It would also, I think, lend better to scaling to, toward the residential. Um, and that court, you know, gallery corridor thing is is sort of intriguing as it was. You know, I can only imagine it being like a big glass sculpture, like perched on the building somehow. I think it's forced. The connection is kind of forced, and it, you know, there are so many other primary um, problems, like you know, configuring this site in a way that really. Uh, is more about the property than the logistics of getting people into the parking spot. Um, I think it's a good suggestion. Jim, do you um, think that just in concept? Well, I'm not so sure. I mean, it, I think I know we're talking about getting to the same place, you know, which is like appropriately appropriate addition or additional building that relates well to the original building you know, that, that transitions well to the I'm not sure that, that turning that to splitting the lot and making the residential lot back there is it's like there's so many hurdles and contortions that we need to do for that a residence. You see to the residents like you were creating a park lot, you know, special. You know, well, it could be achieved now through multiple buildings. Too. Yeah. If you don't build so much of work here uh, because of like parking requirements, setback requirements, um, things of that nature that I think uh, are going to create more issues than they resolve, probably. Yeah. Um, so I, I, if we're going to go that route, I would, I would kind of focus on, on this building idea yeah. and, you know, get down that road. If that, if not, we can continue down. It seems the like current the, road too, if, you know. It seems to me like the current submission made progress on that. You know, as a, you know, 
as you submitted it now as one line. As one. You know, I mean, I'm inclined to buy the, the those all things because I feel like that's the better outcome. So just to clear, we're not trying to stop the same. I know, I understand, but uh, what we're trying to do is, is <laughs> I think that's concerned about the kind of sleep plan. Yeah. And the connection and all that, we're, we're trying to think about, about the kind of way this development sits in the community. We're not really trying to parse the issues. So that what, what I'm saying is if if we follow the route of saying there might be a path that's a splitting this into two buildings, kind of like the way they are, but calling the back one an apartment building, uh, does does that is that a solution that might get us to a better result? Than, than, uh, than uh, working with, with site plan and connection and all that. That's, that's a real question. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, to get a better result for the community? Yeah, so we originally asked who were the key points. So we said parking not in front of the building. Like, we said that uh, I think I agree with Kathleen that you know, I think if you're trying to accentuate the historic structure, you got to give it. It's it's sort of state context, and so I think anything that's attaching to it or encroaching on it probably is going to be significant. You know, historic asset. Um, so I think that's one part of the project is what to do with the price house itself, and if it, if it doesn't in fact have a great interior, I think we can find a way to to you know, to, to preserve that and, and enhance it as best we can. And as far as the residential component, um, you know, so I think I agree that the issue is there's, you know, it's how do you transition to the, the, the residential neighborhood that's behind the property uh, is a key issue. Uh, I tend to agree with Todd's point that, uh, you know, putting some kind of use on the ground floor um, in this area, though, is helps to activate the sidewalk, for, for example, the gym or any other type of similar use. Um, but I am worried that this, uh, I guess I'm worried about two things. One is the massing of the building, uh, it sort of fills out like a balloon the rest of the lot, and then everything on the ground floor is just automobile or hoods and tailgates, um, except for the sidewalk front. So, um, and I think the the umbilical. I, I don't. I don't. I think a lot of that depends on the design. But I think if, 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 if the historic uh, uh, advisory recommendation is not to alter the historic building, then um, I think it's not going to work. So it's gone. Um, by the way, I don't think we answered your question, Captain. Um, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Adam. Um, you finished the last. That's a hard. Yeah, she asked about the hard. The other, I guess, element that I don't have, uh, I have to read up more on was the issue of shared parking because I am looking at the, you know, the, the program you proposed with 10 residential units. I don't know what the right number is. And, you know, we can get to that number and all that. But with the commercial and the residential together, they're saying they need 18 parking spaces. And, uh, you know, the world is changing with office, right? Now at you know the start next to the you know the office building next door that has an empty parking lot most of the time. Um, these uses are continuing to be redeveloped surrounding this parcel. Um, I personally think you know that for commercial use uh, for office, you know maybe maybe you could park on adjacent parcels and have more have empty parking spaces all day long. So personally, but I know that may not be what the code requires, but I do think that that's a it's a, to me it's a problem. Trying to pack parking for the historic building, for example, if we're trying to save this historic building, we don't want to uh, make two owners a requirement for, for parking for, for that kind of a use, personally. And yeah, you, you, Kathleen had asked about whether the project go to the Right, so um, both um, the current engineer and the borough zoning officer in their letters um, have uh, noted that. That a certificate of appropriateness shall shall be required. So, and I, I'm not sure that you challenge that. I seem to recall you saying if that's necessary, you would do that. So, is that the case? Yeah, if it's required, of course we will uh, do it. Right. 
but the zoning officer in the engineer have indicated that it's required. So, yeah, I just got the letter today, so we'll re review the letters. And maybe um, if there was a compromise uh, along the line that we're talking, that might change. In other words, uh, I don't know if we'll get there, but if that connection wasn't made, I don't know if that would change anything. So, um, if one is required, uh, we'll certainly uh, certainly get the information. Yes. Um, Dave, do you, have, Dave, do you have any thoughts about what you would like to frame into a uh, kind of set of reactions to this project? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess I guess to uh, wrap this up, I think um, I, I guess what I sense is um, there's there's the primary concern I'm hearing about is about the relationship of the new or the added structure to the price house. Just different aspects of that, the scale and massing of it, the closeness of it, the way the back uh, part of the price house is treated with the additions and the, the connection. Uh, there's just a general overall concern about whether this is, uh, well, well, we're happy that the house could be preserved uh, under our historic district ordinance. Is this, is this development sensitive? Enough to the house. Uh, the second concern is the, the kind of auto orientation of the site planning, uh, and particularly the amount of area that is devoted to auto circulation, which I think just many of us seems extraneous, and uh, in the, including the parking in the front, which I don't think any of us believes is an appropriate uh, way to use the front of that yard, whether or not the code. Whatever one's interpretation of the code is. Um, and I think, um, um, I guess I would, I would say those are, are there any other major major issues that you think the, the relationship of the new building to the old building, the, the auto circulation and parking? Are there any other major buckets of issues that you would? Like the relationship to the neighborhood. Transition to the neighborhood. Um, can I just ask a question? So yeah. there's no rear yard on uh, lot like this? Is that the correct interpretation of this? I mean, Kevin, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here, Heidi. Yeah. So there's no rear yard on this property? No. I mean, technically, we don't have standards. This isn't a corner lot, so we can use that table in the rear. Um, so we just kind of went with what made sense in our opinion. We both agree on the site. You have the principal frontage facing Montgomery, a, a, a secondary frontage facing Meeting House, and um, the remaining three sides were viewed as side yards, and I think that makes the most sense. There, there is no, I just want to clarify, there's no secondary frontage. There's a there's the primary frontage, which is the Montgomery, and then uh, the uh, frontage Meeting House is just the Frontage, uh, the secondary frontage, uh, secondary replacement for a lot. A weird lot. <laughs> so, yeah, I just want to make that distinction. It's like a through line. Sure. It's like a through line, really. Yeah. 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 Hopefully, so, we'll yeah. that yeah. 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 I think you've identified. Next to the house, it's a three sizes. Yeah. So, Kevin, you there? Yeah, I'm sorry. You've been going in and out, but I'm still here. Why wouldn't there be a rear? Did you say, why wouldn't there be a rear? Rear lot. Rear lot. I just think, look, I think looking at the property, 
Um, you wouldn't want to call. Um, is Michelle still on? Yes, I'm here. Michelle, do you mind bringing up the um, third page and of sketch drawing? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that if you were to call anything, again, Montgomery has to be the frontage there. So uh, I don't think it's appropriate to call what I would call the opposite of Montgomery, which is Meeting House. The real. And then I also don't think it's appropriate to call um, the property line adjacent to, to Meeting House the rear to Montgomery because it's a side to, to Meeting House. I just think based on how different lines makes this a little tough to classify everything but i don't see it i don't see any way to put a, a rear yard in that would make sense looking at it from either meeting house or from montgomery which is why a subdivision would cause you know significant loss of use of property right well, one of many like what? <laughs> the others um, what i don't um, is, is there anyone besides Jim who has a concern about, about the possibility of um, uh, allowing for an apartment building if it allows for, if, if for some reason or other that allows for a better um, site planning outcome, a better design outcome, particularly in regard to how this to the price house. I, I think so to, to be realistic with the parcel, right? I mean if you were, if you're going to develop the parcel with any kind of larger use than say a single family house or something, which would be what the zoning calls for anyway, uh, you know, what else could go back there, right? If you put it if you put an office building back there, which is probably I'm not sure what the commercial market for that would be, but just hypothetically it's then next to the single family house, right? It's the next lot down. Um, you know, it's off of the busy commercial arterial, so it's not either a retail site. So you might be able to put in like a gym or something that's not relying so much on the frontage on Montgomery, but it, it seems like the performa is gonna work much better as a residential unit. The, the use on this, because it's sort of tucked into the residential context, you know, and then, the price house is on the commercial frontage, but it's the historic right, asset that you're trying to keep unaltered. So I, I think that to me, it's you know it, it, it recognizes the site as it is potentially. There are, there's an argument to be made that that's you know sort of the highest and best use given the constraints of the property. Uh, uh, Dave, are you on the line still? Yeah, I'm here. Did you, did you hear the question that we're asking? We're trying to sort of summarize the major issues, the major issues being um, the, the uh, relationship of the addition to the original structure. Uh, second one being the um, amount of space devoted to auto circulation and parking in front of the price house. And then the third is how do you make the best possible transition to the adjoining residential neighborhood? Right. Right. You're breaking, you're breaking up. Um, in exploring the site further, would figuring out a way for the rear building to be considered for there to be a rear building considered as an apartment building, would that be something you'd be open to if it produced a better solution? Yeah, I'd be, I'd be open. I'd be open to hearing more about that. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm working at a bit of a disadvantage because I missed most of the discussion, but yeah, I, I think there's, there are other avenues that should be explored here. Um, well, I think we've gotten about as far as we can. I'm kind of curious what your reactions are to the. So there's three kind of large issues. I'm trying not to debate the five points to go, but what, how this fits into this site. Yeah. Um, and a willingness for what might have 
necessarily have a issue. Normally, at this point, to summarize, they, they, you know, next week and a half now, so they would have an opportunity if they wanted to do the third round. Before that's kind of how things might work. Um, I'm wondering um, how, how that all, how you how you react to all that, or do, do you feel like with these comments in mind, or things you can work further? Do you just in, in trying? <laughs> uh, so that seems to be a hot topic, um, and I think that, that that's probably the easiest workaround out of the entire, all, out of all the issues uh, raised. Um, so, so that certainly we can work together to resolve that. I think one of the ways to resolve that is to find a home for those parking spots. Um, uh, and just sitting here kind of, kind of thinking it through, um, I think uh, that the idea of doing a conditional use for an apartment building Doing a separate building may allow for, um, uh, and I don't want to get too technical, but you know, if I can put residential use on the first floor, I can maybe move parking elsewhere, uh, and it may be a better outcome for everyone. Uh, so I think it's probably worth exploring that if that's a route that you all are open to going. I don't want to go down that path and then find out, you know, in three weeks or four weeks that you know, we'll be second. We don't want to do that. Um, so I would ask that we just be clear with each other about that. If there has to be offline discussions regarding that, I'm happy to do that um, and then kind of work through that. But I think that would be a path that I think probably makes the most sense for the neighborhood, the for me, for the planning committee. I think just I think that's worth talking through. I think that resolves the parking issue um, regarding the architectural stuff. Um, you know, we're just not there yet, uh, I would say, um, as part of the preliminary um, sketch plan. Um, but we will certainly take, you know, all of those recommendations into consideration when when we get to that point. Um, so I think that's that's my general feedback. Um, so again, if, if that conditional use front part building is a route that we want to go down, um, again, just let's be clear, and, and, and if we're going to go down that road, I'd like to you know, make sure we get to the end. We're going to need feedback on that from council. Of course. Because of course. Course. The, there currently is no route to do that. And I would, well, that's one reason. I would feel bad about sending the demo. No, 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 we can't do that. No, no, no. Okay. No, what, what, what we can do is, is um, I don't know, Jim, if you, how strong you want to register your, your thoughts about that. If, if, but what I would do is write a letter to council and say, here's what we found out. Here's a discussion we had. Here's what we think would happen, and then ask them to provide feedback at their meeting. And I don't, I don't think it's fair to ask you that until you hear anything that the council might have to say. They might say the meeting, or the solicitor might have to. I don't know. I think what we would do is simply say, "Here's the concerns. Here's the issues. Here's some paths we think might be valuable to, to explore, and some of them might require some changes to the code." That you know, given Jim's comment, that there's mostly a feeling that would be a good idea, but some concern. So that's that's how uh, we would follow up. Um, I was talking to Mike. What we think makes sense, and we do appreciate you uh, you being willing to take the time to write a letter to council. And that feedback might be valuable, but we're also thinking we've 
we've spent so much time with you tonight. We got some good ideas. We're thinking maybe we should come back to you first and see if we made any progress and then uh, go. Um, yeah. So to not have you write the letter, we wouldn't go to the council just yet. We would come back regroup and come back to you in April and see where we stand. Okay. That's well, that would that would I think that would be fine. Yeah. And uh, in the meantime, if, it's, if is there someone on the board who is very willing to uh, maybe it's Kevin um, to contact in the meantime if we have questions as we're going down there? Because what I'd, I'd like to do is come in April with a plan that we've worked through together um, that we sort of all know where we're getting to in April, and then you know hopefully then uh, you know the board and, and everyone can we can still keep this moving for in April, uh, but basically. So, so what I'd suggest in that count is um, in terms of technical questions, if there's zoning questions, I you always have the option to connect Kevin. If there are engineering questions, stormwater, whatever, you always have the option to connect contact Derek anytime you want. Yeah, I think I think the, the questions that will probably come up would be more along the lines of like, is this an appropriate project? Right. And you know, what I would suggest there is um, I think the best course would be to kind of, if, when you're ready to have that conversation, contact the borough office, call, yeah. contact either Michelle Carroll or Samantha Bryant, and they will convene a meeting and they'll probably invite a couple of us, they might invite Kevin or whoever. I would prefer that to go through the borough office so they know what's happening. They, they traffic all of this, yeah. but our, our, our uh, history is we're quite willing to come to so this. I mean, we're interested in getting good results, and so we're interested in coming to this conversation. Um, I don't want to volunteer to Kathleen, but Kathleen is a fountain of uh, information about the historic property and the nature of it and ways to approach how that could be. So um, that sounds like a good course of action. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, so then let's just go for a and see what we do. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, on our agenda, it's the circle south of the field setting. Um, I'm going to start. Well, I'd very much like to make sure we talk about this station circle and the new group um, because the new group do have a responsibility to make a recommendation to council. About that, and the station circle is a um, let's just say a train that's moving from the station. So we did have a Dave. Yeah, are you? Well, I wanted to ask. Me? Well, what I wanted to ask is, I don't know how you're feeling and how long you want to stick around. Uh, would you prefer to talk about station circle and then call it a night, or would you like to stick through both topics? I'm just yeah, well, you're not. Feeling why why don't why don't I uh, give my brief report um, and then as much as I would hear the rest of the conversation to tell you the truth to, to understand about ten percent of it really doesn't do do anybody much good so I'll probably sign off um, but um, excuse me the floor is yours and we can hear you just fine okay well that's Half of the equation, anyway. Um, okay, um, as you all probably know, uh, and I apologize ahead of time if I go into a fit of coughing, but you'll please bear with me. Um, Jim Cornwell and I met with uh, Michelle Pennanopoulos, um, and Jim and I have met several times since then uh, to organize a, a design effort uh, uh, intended to engage the public and uh, uh, solicit pu public opinion and get design ideas about the renovation of what was once known as the Station Circle and now we are referring to as the Town Square. Uh, the area in question is actually larger than just the immediate traffic circle 
and we're we're looking um, at the area that generally extends from the corner of North Essex to Haver and Haverford Avenues over to uh, a place uh, a little bit to the east of the intersection of Forest and Haverford Avenues. So, you know, we see this, this effort as looking at, at redeveloping the, um, the landscape, the hardscape and softscape for, for that entire zone and not just the, the immediate area of what we tend to think of as the station circle. What we're imagining is a series of three public meetings occurring in April and May with the idea of wrapping up by Memorial Day, which will um, begin with an introduction uh, to, the, to the existing uh, cir circle and uh, surrounding site, uh, soliciting the public opinions, and then having a, um, a bit of a design exercise similar to ones that we did when we were uh, putting together the form-based code to engage the public in, in working over uh, site plans on a series of tables. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then having a wrap-up meeting uh, to present the ideas that were presented in, in the, uh, the previous meeting. Uh, during that time too, the, um, the borough will be issue, issuing a request for proposals to a pre-selected um, short list of qualified uh, landscape architects uh, to be able to provide design services to take those ideas that were uh, presented in the public meetings and at the borough council's direction, um, develop them into actual construction documents uh, that could be used to implement the renovation. Um, so we are right now in an information, <coughs> excuse me, information gathering stage, the critical part of this. You don't want to uh, go through this whole thing and then uncover some critical piece of information that completely derails the, the process. So uh, we're working with the borough to uh, uh, find out uh, various questions about land ownership, uh, both of the, uh, uh, the circle and adjacent properties, uh, utility information, whether there are any easements or that kind of thing. Um, and uh, so that's going on now. Uh, I have a, a draft for a request for proposal for the design teams that I'm going to circulate to Jim uh, tomorrow. Uh, so we'll, we'll we be, be moving that along. And as I said, the, the idea is to get this in place so that uh, the meetings will be ha held. Uh, probably the first one would be sometime in mid-April. And the last one would be before, the third one would be before um, Memorial Day. Um, we're going to need uh, uh, quite a bit of help on this. So anybody on the planning commission, I've heard from some people already who are willing to jump in, there'll be a quite a bit of legwork. So if you would, uh, if you haven't done so already, if you will email Jim and me, then we will uh, get back in touch with you at the right time. And that's my report. Thank you. Any questions? It's from the public, one member of the public. Well, Dave, thanks both to you, Jim. Um, one, one, more, one more point I didn't make, and that is that from, from the Planning Commission's side of the table, and, um, and I think I can say the Borough Council side, is that we, we uh, approach this with no preconceived ideas, the idea is not to put design ideas in front of the public and, and try to either influence them or, or uh, skew the discussion in any, in any way. Uh, the idea is really to start with a blank piece of paper and hear what, what the public has to say about what works, what doesn't work, uh, what, what they like that happens there, what they don't like that happens there, what they would like to see happen there, and from that develop the design. 
but it really is uh, while all of us all probably have some of our own preconceived ideas, the idea is really to try to start from a blank as as much as possible from a blank slate. And the heavens open up. Yeah. I'm not sure if the, if the powers that be like this, but I'm going to push back from the weather. All right, Dave. Well, thank you guys. Keep, keep us posted. Thank you. Now I really literally cannot hear anything because of the rain pounding on my roof. So I will, I will bid you a good night. Bye. Good night. Good night. Okay. So we'll move on to our next item, which is the Sensei uh, Now, I'll, uh, you know, we've discussed this for many months um, and uh, shaped up a draft ordinance which council has after um, So, a kind of formality in the process is for us to write council. We have the opportunity to make a recommendation to council about this ordinance we've already prepared. So, um, normally at this stage it is a formality, but we did receive today some uh, questions, and comments from Dave Schoenhart, uh, which I forwarded to you when we received them. Um, and I, I think that it's um, important to make sure we're familiar with the questions he's raised and make sure that we have confidence that um, the code we've offered uh, addresses them. I, I believe they do. Um, but I wanted to uh, first ask if anyone on the planning commission had a chance to review them and if you flagged anything that you feel merits discussion or concern um, uh, or anything that you think Merits our attention at the moment. Sorry, attention for considering or for answering? Or what's the... Okay, good question. Well, first, is, is it, did Mr. Schoenhardt flag anything you feel like we didn't consider and maybe we ought to take up? I don't want to rehash things we've already decided. Um, and then I do think council would like us to be able to um, address in a simple way. Um, these questions or comments, which I'm, I'm hopeful we could do most of just by going back to our minutes and you know replaying what we've already decided. But I guess the first question is: Is there anything in the letter that you felt, huh? Uh, we actually didn't talk about that, or that's a real consideration. I guess it'd be interesting. So the, I think some of the later comments I feel probably have to do with um, structure code and use of occupancy. So I mean, just for my own comfort, I might want to just be reassured that. Yes, you know, these, these are going to be expected to have a little bit the way that the commenter was describing. Mm -hmm. I feel like we have to step out of power. Well, I see Kevin is still. Yes, so I'll ask mm -hmm. Kevin. So, first of all, our assumption has always been that whether new construction or renovation, a building will have to be filled with. Right. It's been clear to us from our architecture colleagues on the commission from day one, and I think it's always been an assumption. Kevin, can you? I know it wasn't until late in the day that I sent this to you. Um, did you have a chance to look at this at all? I've been trying to skim over it for the last five minutes, and I actually talked to David on the phone, so I think maybe answered some of his questions already. Okay. Well, in general, um, can you explain to us? Uh, and any, any, anything about your conversation with him that you think would be important, and in general, what the interplay is between the building code and the zoning code for our satisfaction? Yeah, I think uh, David's concerns primarily dealt with um, proximity to property lines and how that it's a fire hazard. Um, and I expect that, like we just said, the building code or residential code will kind of take care of them regardless of what the zoning code allows or doesn't allow. I think generally you want them to agree. In other words, you want the building code to allow something that the building code um, won't, but there's always an opportunity to make it compliant. You can always construct something safer, make code. Um, one of the big concerns was that we now allow um, accessory structures, property lines, whereas the building code would require a specific type of fire resistance rating 
on that exterior wall. It wouldn't allow for openings, so that could that could cause issues with egress from the dwelling unit. Uh, that was a big concern. He was also concerned with some of our properties have um, kind of the four shared garages or even the two shared garages that have a zero setback. He was super concerned with that. And the type of construction would be required to be essentially a firewall. Um, and now are we requiring that onus to be shared between the property owners where the garage spans or how I would be, I guess, inspecting that and enforcing that. Um, so a lot of his questions were geared towards technical, towards me, um, and not. I don't think they were geared towards you. Uh, but I think ultimately he just wanted the codes to mimic each other. Again, he doesn't want the zoning code to allow something the building code generally wouldn't or would require additional um, kind of methods of construction that are, are uncommon. Um, I think our, our, our general conversation about this was uh, where there might be a difference in the zoning from the building code, obviously, point code may be father, followed, even if it required uncommon construction methods, which would potentially just be a break on people's ability to do things that aren't safe, right? Uh, are, you, are there any inconsistencies between these codes that give you concern, Kevin? The one I haven't, he didn't bring up was D, and I kind of haven't had time to digest that. So you want to give me a few minutes to skim through D and make sure that I don't see anything else that stands out if you want to circle back in a couple minutes? Of course. Okay. Of course. okay. So, Jim, that was, were there any other issues that you felt? Um, I do want to point out um, that there was a concern about. Uh, what would happen, the fact that, about the ability, whether or not somebody who created an accessory dwelling unit would have the ability to subdivide their property, create two properties, therefore have two houses. Um, and Jim and I both kind of reacted the same way. I mean, my, I'll speak for myself, and Jim can speak for himself. Um, I think that is a rare circumstances because in order to subdivide, uh, you would need have access to a lot, lot to a, to a street, to have a property that runs a street. So that means you need either an extra wide lot or a through block lot. Uh, even if it were in the historic district, um, um, you know, you would still need at least to subdivide at least in, uh, enough uh, area to put a cottage on. And I, I, I guess, uh, I don't think there's a reason to be concerned that someone might build a house that's small <laughs> or smaller than a cottage or have one on a property. I think he was concerned that since we have this rule about, um, I mean, I mean, I'm inferring he is concerned that because we have a rule that the ADU, uh, that the property owner must live on the site where the ADU is, that by subdividing, you then break that link and you get all of a sudden a new housing unit on the market. Um, um, that didn't have a parking space, but I think if it were subdivided, it would have to have a parking space. And then, um, 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 in, at the end of the day, I don't, I honestly don't think we're concerned about having an extra house where we would permit one as an AD here. So I didn't feel it to be an extra house that's uh, 800 square feet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that could be there for an AD here. <laughs> So I didn't, I just, I played it through. I just don't think it's concerned. Jim, what, you yeah, commented on this. I think, it's an, I think it's a non-issue. If you have the ability to subdivide, you need 6,000 square feet for each of the subdivided lots. You need 40 foot of frontage. So, I mean, if you're concerned about, like you're saying, you just end up with a, a legal, a lot of legal size, but with a tiny house on it. Not sure why that's worse than a lot with a normal size house on it. The building of the ADA does not create any new opportunities for subdivision that weren't up there already. Right. So right. it doesn't need to be tied to the ordinance. Right. right. So if you can subdivide, you can subdivide whether or not you have an ADA on the lot. It doesn't that doesn't impact your ability to subdivide the lot. Um okay, so I don't think anyone says this. There's a concern that Converting an ADU garage, a functioning garage, to an ADU might re result in a net loss of a parking spot. Um, that the house.
also may have relied on that parking spot and now doesn't have a parking spot. Um, I suppose that could happen. I no, no, we never, we don't allow that. To, no, we can't true. eliminate the parking spot. We still have that parking spot. If it's required for your house, you can't eliminate the parking spot wherever. Because you would then not. Still applies. You would still have a certificate of occupancy. Okay, so you, right. couldn't, you couldn't remove the parking spot you're supposed to have. Okay, so right. have to have a parking spot. Okay. Uh, there's a comment about it's not the borough's right to wait. We, we are allowing non-conforming buildings um, in certain circumstances to be, that are not going to be for site planning rules to be converted to um, accessory dwelling units. They could potentially be expanded even. Um, he writes, it's not the borough's right to waive non-conformity and allow additional non-conformity and top non-conforming non variance. Actually, our code does allow for non-conformities to be expanded by a certain percentage, I believe uh, that's like 25%. So I don't believe that is correct. Um, I, I have my only that, that's one comment that made me think a little bit, and I, it made me think that maybe these provisions actually don't need to be in a CP ordinance to um, want it to. The whole thing about a non-conforming building, I think that would all be true, even if you didn't say it. I think it's probably okay to say it, but. Uh, you can use an existing non-conforming building for, but the use isn't non-conforming. So that you can put in a, a conforming use in a non-conforming building right. already. But that, you don't need to say that you can do that. Right. I think what we're actually saying is, what we want to do is take away the ability to put a non-conforming use in a building that was too non-conforming in terms of the area that was too big. That's what we put that in because we wouldn't say it's okay in all circumstances if the less area of the uh, garage that's being converted is more than 600 feet around. Well, you're getting to my uh, building coverage, building footprint comment, which I hope you get to next week. I think you're using the wrong term here to get that point across. Okay, well, um, let me just, there's one other. We have some questions about addressing, but the language for the addressing came from the fire chief, and we know who wins when players go up against the fire chiefs, right? Um, this is concerned about um, the um, 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 it not being enforceable that the owner um, be required to live in the ADU or the primary house. I think we flagged that as planning commission by the borough council in the last. It's interested in that provision, and that is simply uh, an enforcement matter. Um, so we have um, Chloe has one comment. Kevin, did you come up with anything else in the last minute or two of your review? Yeah, um, like I said, I think a lot of the things are uh, not a jab at me, but in most municipalities, the zoning kind of unit is completely separate from the construction side. So the zoning officers very rarely looking at the building permits. Um, luckily, Norberth has that where I do both, and I'm looking at them at the same time. So there's not going to be a lot of misinformation on what needs to be provided from a construction standpoint to make these buildings safe as the zoning. And I think the one that brought up was that it sounds like he's concerned that the have an existing dwelling unit with a garage that has one parking space that lot is compliant as it as it pertains to parking not only are we removing the garage parking but now we're providing an additional dwelling unit and the concern is from a compliant one space per one unit to now you have spaces per two units i think that's what he's saying right well we are not requiring a parking spot for an adu but I still think he's concerned about the creating a non-conformity, whereas the existing dwelling unit had its compliant one space. How would that be evaluated, Kevin, if that application came in? Would they be allowed to convert that garage if they had no other parking option? No, not if they didn't have one, although, unless they were in a district that allowed for a parking credit for on street parking. I mean, they'd have to kind of request that I could steer them in that direction, but that's they'd have to have a parking credit or another surface parking spot somewhere else. 
they would have to meet their parking requirement one way or the other if they remove the spot to create the idea. Yeah, correct. That's all we need to know then. And then um, oh, there's one other thing which I thought was here interesting is um, for buildings that are on the property line within one or two feet, we did talk about the accessibility, you know, if you need to be repaired. And, and I think I recall you saying, well, folks work this out all the time, you know, you can step on your neighbor's lawns, you can work in your garden, whatever, it happens all the time. Um, I did look this up and I found there are some AD ordinances that um, require you to have an easement, uh, to request an easement from your neighbor if you're building too close to the property line. Um, I'm wondering if you all feel that level of formality, Kevin or Chloe, if you have experience that uh, could bring the bear, is that level of formality necessary to if a building is too close? To the adjacent property line to have an easement from the uh, you know to, for the ED owner to get an easement from their neighbor to access the building from someone else's lot. Yeah, I mean I've experienced this quite a bit, especially in the city. But um, some there's problems where your neighbors is not accessible, or you guys kind of just don't get along, and sometimes the neighbors has that access agreement, whether it's just for maintenance or for construction. Um, it's a tough situation for a homeowner that has like a buy right either zoning and building permit, but they actually can't construct it um, or doesn't allow access. And I think that's why a lot of people push for setting these structures back so that they don't have to get involved in that. Right. But I think we've noted in Narver, because we have tight lots, especially if you are converting an existing structure, um, I, I don't think we allow new construction that close to the property line. It's, it's more about converting old structures. So I guess the question is, it, it I think we dismiss that as a concern, assume, because because this happens all the time in our birth that things work out. But would it make sense to revisit that and suggest that an easement be requested from the next door neighbor if your property, if your ADU is too close to the property? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think that was our inclination. I'm, I'm just because the public raised this question I'm asking. I think that was our inclination to begin with. Um, you agree? Um, okay. So, Chloe, do you have any opinion about that matter? Could you read more code than me? Um, no, I just looked up the AARP and APA model ordinances. They recommend a minimum four foot setback beside their lot lines, but. I think we're requiring three, but it's it's more a matter of existing buildings are converted that are right. because we live in this built out community. Model codes are usually for <laughs> so. Um, have okay. you seen easement issues or access issues? I haven't. So I think our inclination then is is to say that our goal here is really to facilitate this happening and the extra easement. Um, um, is is more of a barrier than a benefit. Okay, Chloe, I think that's all the things I wanted to just review with you all. Um, I know Council Member Winston's on, and I'm sure you would appreciate having you know this information for Council. Uh, Chloe, what was your issue? I was just um, the uh, the language about building coverage and the first building footprint is in my review letter, so I was thinking you would. Get to that. Oh, here we are. Okay, Should we start there. So yeah. the the term building coverage is used a few times in the draft ordinance, and I think that actually some of them should be building footprint, and one of them maybe should be habitable floor area. So that's and some of them are correct as building coverage. Building coverage is usually expressed as a percentage of the total lot covered by buildings, but there's this clause. So to B, two, B. So that's the that's the first one is the um Chloe, are you saying it should be building I think that um where it says the maximum building coverage of our accessory dwelling unit shall be six hundred square feet, that that should be building footprint instead of building coverage. Mm -hmm. It's a drafting error, basically. Right. Is that the only correction? No. The other one is in the non-conforming section where it says the accessory building should be. 
an, an existing accessory building that is non conforming in regards to a number of different things that may be converted. Oh, sorry. What, can you just cite the, the number? Yes. C2E1. Okay, got it. Okay. Um, maybe converted to an accessory building unit as long as the accessory building does not exceed the maximum building coverage allowed for an accessory dwelling unit. Not sure what the in, whether the intent there is building footprint or habitable floor area or both. I think it's building, I think the intent was uh, the footprint. Okay, so 600 square feet foot building footprint. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then probably, uh, probably um, also changed it. Is that your recollection? Building footprint, yeah. Um, are there any, any other questions? Uh, those are the only two related to that issue. So, okay. Okay. So I think the main thing that came up from our internal review is the height requirement, which I all have a good explanation, but maybe you can clarify for me about the 16 feet height limit, right. especially if you're adding an ADU above an existing garage. Mm -hmm. the 16 feet can be adequate for putting an apartment unit above an existing garage, you feel pretty cool. Well, height is the midpoint. Oh, the yeah, yeah, I understand. In order to keep it, you know, the minute is not over. Right. So you could, you know, if you have that slope, that midpoint, you know, you could actually rise higher than 16. Right. The existing garage could be 12 feet tall, though. And you can right. still have a dormer. Yeah. You know, that this isn't meant for every garage to be okay. converted. But it is possible because it's not as tight as it sounds because it's a bit point. Okay. And then I wanted to just make sure everyone was aware that I did consult with our public safety and GIS departments outside of the planning commission about the unit numbering. And I recommend just a slight adjustment to the language here um, so that it will go through our public safety system. So it's, they really hate like a, 23 and a half or 23A mm -hmm. addresses. Uh, they really want is like it's they want the same house number on all of the units on the lot, but then to have a unit number that follows. So either 23 and 23 unit one or 23 unit one and 23 unit two. And that either of those is an okay solution. Does uh, that contradict what's written here or just? Yeah, it does a little bit because what's written in the draft says a property street number different from the principal building. So I recommend just a property unit number different from the principal building. So I think what we can do there is ask the solicitor to check with our fire officials and say mm -hmm. that we appreciate they confirm with the county emergency services. Right. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, we should definitely check, run it through your. Um, I think it was your police chief who commented, but and I think his email somewhere. He was just wanting to make sure that the county's nine one one system would register this appropriately, and this okay. is what we'll get that to So, does anyone have any objections to recommending the council this small modification to the ordinance? Okay, so what I'm going to do is um, sometimes if you if the solicitor will, will, will determine whether these are material changes that will require the ordinance to be re-advertised, which I don't think we want. Um, if it needs to be re-advertised, what I recommend the solicitor is that they pass this ordinance as is, and then when they advertise the infill ordinance, they make these corrections so that they'll roll around another month later, which I don't think will be a condition. So um, that's uh, what I'll do. And otherwise, we would recommend to uh, approve this with the modifications recommended by SCPC. I think we need to formally vote on that. So all in favor. Uh, recommended approved with the modifications requested by MCPC. Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Aye. Oh, and then I will also convey the council our responses to Mr. Schoenhardt's comments. Um, I think um, uh, left on our agenda tonight is infill zoning ordinance in the sound of it because it's late. I think we should, uh, we should move on. So, in terms of the sound of um, Chloe, can you, I know we emailed about this briefly today, can you talk to us about how forward from 
what you see at the moment? Yes, so um, we are moving forward. In, I've been meeting monthly with Eric, as well as with Kevin and Michelle, um, looking through some of the issues that have been brought up by planning commission members and that we had sort of questions about what was the best language for members. Um, and we did circulate another <clears throat> revised version of the design standards as well as some new sections that you hadn't seen before prior to this ordinance. And I'd encourage you to take a look through those and if you you know if you get time and you have comments to send me back comments by email because we are still discussing at the staff level some various things. I should have some new comments from Eric today. So I'll be incorporating that and we'll be continuing to make progress on that. And you know, Chad asked, you know, whether we should schedule a special meeting for discussion and I my inclination is to put that off a little bit as we're still sort of uh, making progress, which you know, we are with the additional new sections we're, we're kind of closing in, but that if you see something and you're looking at something and say, no, this, is, this doesn't make sense to me, this doesn't work for me. And one of the things I wanted to point out that we did circulate was a draft of the transportation impact study requirement, which you don't currently have, I don't think. Uh, no, it's not very strong. Yeah. Um, so, sort of drafted something together for that, and I think that is something that some of you may want to review and comment on. Um, I encourage you to just. I was going into that, and I, so I was looking at it today. There is, I would ask if you do look at that section, if there in there is the thresholds of when it's triggered that you have to provide the full like engineer impact study, uh, and it's based on the intended use of the property. So setting that. Those numbers, I think, would benefit from feedback from, from all of it. Right. And you know, ongoing with the design section, that's everything that's you know being of the most interest to the section members. But um, and we'll try to to really work on work on all of these. And there aren't that many such like this is all that's almost all of it. There's just the yeah, mobile home parks section, which is required in every municipality by the municipality's land code, um, but probably doesn't need a whole lot of discussion. And um, section. I don't know, we're, we're close to having a draft of everything. And um, so I guess I would propose that uh, send me comments by email if you have them. And Eric and Kevin and Michelle and I will meet another couple times to try to, to work through some of the issues or anything that Right up here and bring you sort of closer to final revised drafts for, for discussion. And when we have all that, if there's not time at a meeting to discuss it, maybe we do want a special meeting and say, look, here, we work through a lot of issues. Here's the full draft. Let's just discuss this. Okay. Kevin or Eric, do you have any comments on the South Road you'd like to make? Uh, I don't. That, that, the input on the, uh, on the traffic impacts by the biggest uh, new item right now that would uh, benefit. Okay. Kevin, do you have any comments on the Sado you'd like to make? Nothing for the Soldo. Okay. Anything else? <laughs> okay. Um, so um, I would like to move on then to public comment and then adjournment. So um, I see one member of the public with us at the moment. And is there any comments um, about any matters for the planning commission from the public? Okay. So with that, um, we will post Comisado, we'll post the infill. I'll say about the infill is um, uh, I, I, I did know Grove Council um, has, has, has determined that it would like to advertise the ordinance, and I expect that they will formally vote on that at the next meeting. They recommended one change to the infill ordinance, which, which was to reduce the cottage size from 2,000 to 1,800 square feet. Uh, there will be discussion about that matter. And so, um, Otherwise, I believe they are prepared to advertise it. So, so that, hopefully that work will, will move forward. So, uh, I think that's all there is to report on that. I did provide you all a, a current copy of the ordinance. So is it live before it gets formed into the actual ordinance language? Let me know. How does that take ever to my first one? Is there one second? Um, let me double check the data. I think there is. I think, yes, there is because I edited it after the council meeting to change the cottage size. So, um, yeah, I'll share. Okay. So with that, um, I will ask for motion to adjourn. Mm -hmm.
Thank you.